Thank you, Mr. Draghi. Prime Minister Draghi. Thank you, Chancellor Merkel. My name is Melissa Eddy, and I am honored to be here as part of the Global Solutions, and certainly with um, two leaders who have shown uh, in not so long ago that they are willing to both do whatever it takes to shop and us or achieve that which needed to be achieved in the face of a great uh, challenges like those we're facing right now uh, in the wake of the global pandemic. And um, we've been talking a lot, both of you have raised the idea of, uh, of the chance that we have to revive multilateralism right now uh, with the return of the United States to the global discussion. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing a nationalism returning in the face of the pandemic. We're seeing borders going up in Europe. We're seeing nationalism surrounding vaccines. So I wanted to ask each of you, and Chancellor Merkel, let's start with you. What specifically do you think steps could be taken to ensure that some of these lofty goals that we talk about in these discussions can really lead to uh, the forming of things ahead. Well, as I see it, um, I believe that the lessons we have learned from this crisis are undoubtedly going to change our outlook on globalization. And I think uh, it will influence developments in the following two ways. Take, for example, the European Union and the question of sovereignty. What do we want to be able to do on our own with regard to the production of medical goods, for example, but also with regard to other issues? This question or issue of our own sovereignty is going to play a more prominent part. And we are talking about this these days. We are talking about the kind of uh, vaccine production we want to set up in Europe. We also want to um, shape our digital sovereignty and we are also talking about what that actually means. But at the same time, we realize that there is a thin line that we need to draw with respect to protectionism. Thus, we have to be very clear in making the point that we don't intend to do any, everything on our own because it's going to be a throwback for the world at large. But we want to see a global competition about the best outcome, which is to say that if we want to ensure the global supply chains and multilateralism is maintained because we need those global supply chains, we need agreements that are also resilient to crisis, that are reliable. And we have to have the guarantee that even in a crisis, people not all of a sudden say that, well, I'm going to keep everything because my people need it. We need to have a minimum of things agreed. Uh, we need to be able to rely on these in times of crisis. And then we have to focus on those areas where we can perhaps think a little bit more of ourselves, but we need to be able to plan this way ahead. Uh, not others ought to be doing it on our behalf. I believe that the European Union is a space now, has become a space where we should not focus on producing vaccines to vaccinate the members of the European Union, but also to vaccinate others. And it, I do say, I have, do have to say that I do take pride in the fact that we are exporting vaccines to others. I think we need to read global agreements on these issues. Global discussions that are necessary to move this ahead. Could you hear me? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, the, the pandemic certainly exposed uh, uh, some of uh, some limitations of globalization and some weaknesses. We didn't have shared protocols. We didn't have, we didn't share information for quite a time at the beginning of the process. So there were all kinds of, um, of problems among states. Um, but that shows to me not so much the weakness of multilateralism, but the fact that we didn't have it enough, multilateralism. And um, in fact, the uh, response through an unprecedentedly fast creation, production of vaccines, and the 
all in all, especially from a European side, the sharing and the exports of these vaccines, let's never forget that we export about half of what we produce to countries that until now, even today, don't export anything or have blocked all exports. But basically on our side, there was a convinced sharing of multilateralism, which in the end provided the right response. So um, it was, uh, multilateralism was weak at the beginning because there wasn't enough of it. Uh, the response is actually a multilateral response. And the, uh, what Angela said is absolutely right. I completely agree with her. The EU is a new space, has shown its sovereignty in, uh, in the vaccine campaign, it's shown its sovereignty in the production of vaccines. But I think this um, shared sovereignty will, uh, will touch many other fields. And the external developments, the foreign affairs developments, international relations developments, only show how we need a joint sovereignty in Europe in many fields or besides, besides the, health, uh, the, uh, the health area. Thank you. Thank you. So the idea almost of taking this pandemic and using it as a launching point for what we're learning to take it further into other fields. Um, on that note, Chancellor Merkel, you mentioned uh, a couple of things regarding vaccines, research and development, the need for investment there. There's been a global discussion about patents and patents for vaccines. Now you touched on this talking about COVAX, the ACT program within COVAX, uh, which is facing a, an urgent funding gap of two billion at the same time as Western nations are struggling to, to fill that. How do you propose com concretely that we're able to get a vaccine strategy for the future set up where we can ensure financing and production and distribution equality amongst all nations, also in regards to the idea if, if patents remain protected? Yeah. Um, I well, unfortunately, we still need much more than the two billion euros you mentioned, but um, we have found that it doesn't help a lot to have a lot of money in the account of COVAX because we don't have enough vaccines. We need to produce more, much more than we have done so far. Now, my view is, and that is why I made the point in my speech when I spoke of incentives, I believe we need incentives for the respective companies to further invest into development. If in the situation of a pandemic, those who have been developing these vaccines in breathtaking, with breathtaking speed, um, if we were to turn to them and say, you'll have to forsake your patents uh, right now, I don't think that would be the best thing to do. You know, imagine we're talking companies here that have the ability, the capability to produce these vaccines, and all of a sudden we take away the life, uh, the patents from them. I think what we need is a kind of licensing. We have to make sure that those who don't grant licenses um, that the government stand should be in a position to intervene and to make sure that we can then have compuls compulsory, compulsory licensing. But this is not what we're talking about because the companies we are talking about are producing as best as they can to the limit of their abilities and also willing to grant licenses to any other company. We are talking about vaccines here. We're talking about sensitive goods. We have to make sure that quality assurance stays with us, with those uh, who need to make sure that quality is maintained. What I want to see go out from this is a signal that the world acts in a spirit of solidarity. We have um, agreed to set up production capacities all over the world, also in Africa, in order to ensure that these countries are not dependent on production facilities outside their own continent. But I don't want the message to go out that in a, a next crisis situation, it is no longer worthwhile for companies to invest or to work hard to develop goods or produce or medicine because 
what we want to make sure is that uh, we produce in those sectors where it is most urgently required. We talked about this in greater detail. We focused on what we can do in order to fight uh, the various diseases in Africa. No one in Africa has been carrying out any kind of research there. Once Ebola became a threat to us, we started thinking hard about how we can develop a vaccine. There are many diseases in Africa no pharmaceutical company is looking at or investing in. So what we have to make sure is to encourage pharmaceutical companies to invest their intellectual property into investments that benefit mankind at large. So as far as a waiver that would call into question patent protection is something that I don't think would help us here. 1990s with HIV medicines where it's not fully given up the, the patent waivers but it made more affordable for productions in in developing nations how do you view that well as I said granting licenses is of the utmost importance in that regard licensing fees um, are not being discussed at all right now uh, if things were to be sold at the highest uh, bidder's price, but that is not what is happening. Um, um, the companies are offering the products at a very low price, so making it, uh, adapting it to the respective countries' uh, income, the medium or the low income countries. You see, the, I, 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 I don't think that we can solve the problem of companies, uh, countries not having enough vaccines to go around to cover everyone, but look at the fact that we've been able to develop a vaccine in a very short period of time, less than a year's time, um, with a new technology, the mRNA technology. Of course, you cannot immediately vaccinate twice uh, 7 billion people, but when I look at the promises that Mario Draghi made at his Global Health Summit, 1.3 billion doses to be made available by the end of the year uh, on the part of the companies. I think that's a good first step. The idea of urgency is one that we can also see, Prime Minister Draghi, in the climate issue. And uh, you raised in your opening remarks that Italy will be a co-chair of the COP26 in Glasgow later this year. I was just wondering if you could be a bit more concrete about how do you see the efforts uh, to secure, to, to sort of reconcile the challenge that we face on the one hand, that in the wake of this pandemic, we have enormous debt, countries are in recession around the globe, and at the same time, we need at zero by mid-century. And, and many countries view those efforts in climate change to actually be costly and an investment in governments. So how do we reconcile these two and get countries on board to cut emissions while at the same time investing and reviving their economies? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Tackling uh, climate change uh, is, uh, is a moral obligation. We owe it to our youth and to future generations. But it's also urgent for our economies. We want growth to be sustainable. And we know that the green transition can be itself an engine of economic growth. Italy, as G20 presidency and co-chair of COP26 with the United Kingdom, is working hard to pave the way for a historic goal the commitment of G20 to climate neutrality with net zero emissions by 2050. It is a difficult challenge given the diversity of views and national circumstances, which can make emission reductions costlier in some countries than others. But it is possible, also thanks to the recent decision from the US to return to the Paris Agreement. The next generation EU shows how the green transition can help to lift economic growth. As Italy, we decided to spend almost 40% of the resources on the ecological transition. This is over 75 billion euros in the next five years. So we are, we are fully committed to this, and, uh, and certainly the climate transition is a challenging task. But I want to stress something that Angela just said before. Uh, to win it, we need all actors. The EU itself is responsible for a relatively small part of global emissions. Uh, the others, the United States, in this sense, is very encouraging. They're joining back the Paris Agreement, but also China 
is an important actor in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Draghi. Um, and the idea of the return of the United States to uh, the Paris Agreement also moves into our next question that we have from Paolo Magri, of, who is the chair this year of the T20 in Italy. And he points out that while the Biden administration has returned and relaunched transatlantic relationships uh, in a new spirit of cooperation, at the same time, we're seeing Washington still maintains a much tougher stance on China than the EU does. And uh, he, he's wondering, what impact do you think that this could have on multilateral efforts, both within the G20 or within uh, the upcoming COP? And how do you propose, uh, Chancellor Merkel, as you said, at the Munich Security Conference, to devise a new joint agenda on China? Well, I believe that as far as relations with China are concerned, um, on the one hand, we need to continue to aim for cooperation, think of the issue of climate protection, think of the conference on biodiversity in Kunming uh, in autumn this year, and other uh, global challenges. Without China, we won't be able to tackle these challenges. And China is also part and parcel of uh, a whole host of multilateral organizations. China is a member of G20. So rules are governing our multilateral cooperation, even though we have different social systems from which we come, and even though we are competitors. And this can Competition issue, this character of competition is something that the United States feel much more strongly than do we. China has become a power that did not exist per se in that dimension 20 years ago. So these systemic differences have to be clearly acknowledged and we have to demand reciprocity. That is the idea that I um, try to um, focus on during our presidency of the council, you know, helping us trying to advance the investment agreement with China because as a consequence, we uh, get more reciprocity on markets. But at the same time, we have to think of intellectual property, fair competition, subsidies. These are all issues that need to be openly discussed and addressed because if we don't do so, we will not be able to have a genuinely fair level of competition. The United States are making that point, and I think we will be able to make it together here and there. But sometimes, of course, we do have different interests, and there's no denying that fact. It's not nothing bad in itself. China own social system and the here, when you look to the United States of America and the Western world, we do have a make the same response when it comes to criticizing disregard for human rights. On this issue of China and, and the United States, how do you see uh, the challenges being presented or how do you, how do you propose to and, and the United States are each coming at this idea of how to deal with China? Yes, I'll, I'll follow up on uh, what I hinted before and what Angela has just said. The many challenges we've discussed today all require common ground as shared solutions, which are simply out of reach without the full engagement of the world's major economies. Just to mention uh, it, it, it one data, China accounts for about 70% uh, of global GDP. It's also responsible for almost 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The issue, therefore, is not whether we should look for common ground with China, but rather how we need to preserve a broad space for dialogue and cooperation grounded on a shared understanding of the international rules-based order. Frank open dialogue on issues ranging from finance to labor and digitalization is an essential tool to push these issues forward. Without backing down from our open and democratic values and without refraining from raising our European interests, 
COP26 that we will co-chair with the United Kingdom is a perfect example of a forum in which cooperation and common efforts are required. As I've had the chance to discuss recently with the US Special Presidency, Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, a final question. So in um, 2018, Chancellor Merkel, you were speaking at this uh, Global Solutions Forum and you brought up the idea uh, when in, on the point of equity for women and uh, gender equity, that one of the strongest uh, and most important elements of this is that men need to change their attitudes about the division of labor and the traditional views that many men have of, of women's role in society. And uh, Prime Minister Draghi this year has said, as part of the G20, the idea of gender equality promoting women has been, um, is going to be one of the key issues. I'm just wondering, what advice could you give to him, having over 16 years been confronted time and again with this question, with the idea of how men can help in this entire effort, this global effort to improve women's equality around the world? Well, I, I really think governments have a lot to do. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Did, did you want me to respond to Mario Draghi? To Prime Minister Draghi, of, of your uh, advice that you would give him. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Angela would know much more about this and would, know, would give certainly a better response. But I, I, I think and she would agree that governments have a lot to do in this direction. For example, removing existing barriers to women participation in the labor market and collaborating with the private sector to reduce gender discrimination on workplace. Gender equality is one of the cross-cutting priorities of the Italian Recovery and Resilience Plan. We included specific measures, for example, investing in kindergartens and women's education. We also included a clause all across, the, uh, all across the plan, the EU plan, that will encourage companies that want to take part in the investment to hire more women and more youth. We are also, I wouldn't call it conditionality, but it's ve it gets very close to that. We are also trying to lead by example. For example, my government has appointed the first ever woman as head of the Secret Service. Thank you. Do we have you back? Um, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, we've got you now. We lost you at the first ever woman as head of. I said, I said, I said we, we, we like to lead by example. And uh, to give you an, an example, my government has appointed as the first ever woman head of the Secret Service. Thank you. Thank you both very much. We are low on time now. Unfortunately, it always goes faster than we would like. And in closing, I'd like to bring Dennis back to make a few final remarks. Thank you both. I'd like to thank you because this was a very significant discussion because this is a watershed, I believe, in the history of the G20. Never has the agenda of the G20 been quite as wide as this. You have referred to health, climate change, inequality, and there's been a common thread to what you've said, which is that uh, economic prosperity can become decoupled from economic prosperity back to a recoupling and to provide incentives, uh, as both of you have said, on the health front and the climate front, and also on the inequality front and the compact with Africa is really important. And this recoupling is the source of our latest version of the Global Solutions Journal, which I'd like to present to you digitally and will do so physically. Uh, you have had a previous version of this um, in a past uh, summit, and I'd like to thank you very much um, for this extremely important topic and uh, look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you.
Ja, danke schön und schöne Grüße. Thank you. And kind regards to um, the venue of the Global Solutions Summit and my best regards go out to you, Mario.